Hey everyone, now we're into part three of our cell cycle video series, and today we're going to be focusing on the regulation of the cell cycle. Uh, just like everything else that happens inside the cell, this is highly regulated. So we've got mitosis, right? We've this tiny little chunk of time right there where our cells are actively dividing. We're going through the phases of mitosis, um, and the rest of the time, we've got the growth one phase, right? Mit things are happening here. There's a synthesis phase and another growth phase that lead into mitosis, and at each stage, there is a high level of regulation um, to make sure that the cell does not divide unless it absolutely needs to divide. So we're going to take a look at those checkpoints today and then a couple of mechanisms to do that. And the first one is the G1 checkpoint. And so here in my cell, we're, here's phase G1. Um, and this is before we head into the synthesis phase over here, right? So we are between G1 and, uh, and right kind of at this spot. So that we're just zooming in. Um, zooming in on this portion of our cell cycle. Uh, so back here in our zoom in view, there's a, there's a spot called the G1 checkpoint. And this is kind of just represented by that box right there. Um, but there is a point in G1 before it moves into the synthesis phase, before that DNA is actively divided, where the cell checks a few things. Uh, one of the things it checks is cell size. Now we haven't talked a whole lot about um, surface area to volume ratio right now, but essentially when a cell gets too big, it's not efficient to manage all the material coming in and out. Uh, so it looks at the cell size. Am I big enough to even divide? The second thing it takes a look at is the genomic DNA. Has there been damage to the genomic DNA? If so, repairs need to be made because if you repair, if you uh, divide without having good genetic information, all of those mistakes, all those mutations um, are passed down to daughter cells. So there needs to be some kind of check on the genomic DNA, and that happens at this checkpoint. Has all of that damage been repaired? And this process is irreversible, and this is really important. It is irreversible if those conditions are favorable, meaning DNA will be copied if it goes forward. Um, and that's why a minute ago we just mentioned that it tries to repair that genetic DNA um, or that genomic DNA because if there's a mistake or if there is damage it's going to be transferred um, so this is a really important checkpoint if those conditions are not favorable that cell will remain in G1 until such a time um, it is favorable to go ahead and synthesize and push through the cycle towards another division round um, so that's the G1 checkpoint um, if the G1 checkpoint is passed, it goes through synthesis, and there's a lot of mechanisms there that we've already talked about until we reach the G2 checkpoint. Um, and the G2 checkpoint, again, so we're looking at uh, G2 right there and mitosis right here, so this is kind of the end goal. Uh, we've got another checkpoint right here towards the end of G2, and we've got some other things. First of all, is DNA replication complete? Remember, if it is not complete, uh, we do not have a, a code, right? So this would be like a mutation check. Are there mutations that need to be addressed? Um, if there are no mutations, right, is there any other damage to the chromosome? Oops, need a highlighter. Is there any other damage to the chromosome that needs to be repaired? Um, and again, this, I, I know I've said it and I've said it and I've said it, but if there is damage, that all gets passed down, so the cell needs to make sure there is no damage. If there is damage, some more repairs are attempted to the DNA. Uh, so there are ligases, other enzymes in here, um, repairs are attempted to the DNA. If it cannot repair it, sometimes the cell just dies. It, it, it kind of auto-destructs. Um, there are signaling processes to say, hey, this is not going to work out, and the cell will dismantle itself. There are some enzymes that will digest portions of it, and then the cells around it, if it's a multicellular organism like us, it will absorb some of those biochemicals and use them for their own purposes. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of checking that goes on here in the cycle itself. Um, so how does that happen? What are some of those mechanisms for checking? So if we zoom out and we'll kind of flip and rotate. So there are regulator molecules that can promote or halt a process. Um, a positive control. This progresses um, the cell cycle. This will allow the cycle to continue. And a negative control, the halting, will stop the cell cycle itself. It will stop something along the way. Um, and we're going to look at these, and we've got a couple cases. Um, in the positive side of things, we are uh, going to be talking about two kinds of biomolecules. So we're in the positive uh, controls. This is pushing cell cycle forward. There are cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. And remember when you see that ASE ending, we're talking about enzyme. So, so kinases are enzymes that help the cell cycle. 
And cyclins, these are kind of like hormones, they're chemical signals. Um, so we've got a cyclin expression cycle, and this is the first kind of cont positive control mechanism, and these are predictive. Um, so we've got four different cyclins here. We have cyclin D, cyclin E, A, and B. Um, in different orders, and we each of the colored lines represents the concentration of that chemical signal at each phase of the cell cycle. So when we measure cells, we don't have to look individually at them, we can look at chemical markers um, that suggest what is happening. So you can see cyclin D, we start very, very low at the G1 phase, and it increases over time, and then it decreases again. So if we see a high concentration of cyclin D, we know we're probably in the S or the G2 phase up in here. Cyclin E, this is very specific. So this one will increase steadily and peak right at the uh, G1 to S phase. So this might be something that uh, comes into play at that G1 checkpoint. If cyclin E is present, then the G1 checkpoint may be passed and we move into the S phase. And you can look at the rest as they go, but a cyclin is a chemical messenger that rises and falls in concentration as that cell progresses through the cell cycle. Now the cyclin dependent kinases, so if there's a chemical signal, what is that chemical signal working on? Well, these kinases, um, are, are kind of like when we looked at our regulation of DNA replication. Um, the cyclin is the chemical messenger. The CDK, or the cyclin-dependent kinase, this is an enzyme, and it's got an active site, and cyclin fits into one of those active, active sites. Um, it, all of this needs energy, so a cyclin will bind to a CDK, and that kinase will donate uh, a, a phosphor or a phosphorus. So we have phosphorus or phosphate donating protein called a kinase, and this essentially gives this kinase energy in order to carry out its its job. Uh, so first of all, here's control mechanism A, right? Is the cyclin present? If cyclin is present, can we get a kinase to donate a phosphorus or a phosphate group to give me some energy? Now once we are activated, it can donate that phosphorus to the target protein that will advance the cell cycle. So this is the target, right? This This protein has a job to do. In order to do its job, it needs phosphorus. And so if you look backwards over um, over this, this regulation mechanism, if cyclin is present, then a CDK can be phosphorylated and then donate that, phosphory, that phosphate group to the target protein, which will then advance the cell cycle. So there are multiple steps here in terms of positive regulation. And remember, we are advancing the cell cycle in a positive control mechanism. In terms of negative control mechanisms, there, there's not a whole lot that are well understood, but one we're going to use as kind of our representative, uh, representative sample is a retinoblastoma protein. And these retinoblastoma proteins, these are kind of carrier proteins. Uh, so here's, here's our example. So we've got a retinoblastoma protein that's this kind of blobby guy. And then E2F, remember this is our um, transcription factor from when we looked at gene regulation. So when retinoblastoma proteins are unphosphorylated, uh, the, the gene cannot transcribe because this transcription factor is not present on the DNA. Uh, so remember, transcription factors, they're, they're signals for um, some kind of polymerase to attach to a particular spot on the DNA. So no transcription factor, no transcription of the gene. As the cell grows, this retinoblastoma protein is phosphorylated. We take ATP and we, uh, we lyse it into ADP, and those phosphate groups jump onto the RB, and when this happens, the retinoblastoma protein changes its shape, and that transcription factor, remember this is E2F, it attaches to the DNA molecule, allowing transcription to carry forward. Now, this is a negative control mechanism because the cell cycle cannot carry forward when retinoblastoma is not phosphorylated. Uh, so the, the process is stopped by this, by this mechanism. Um, so this, this transcription factor... It might even code for something like a kinase over here, right? So these are all proteins. They're coded for in the DNA. And so this negative factor, this retinoblastoma, might have some kind of blocking mechanism, um, or if that transcription factor isn't there, it's not going to actually even encode, or it's not going to build that kinase until the, the conditions are favorable. Uh, so again, that was really fast. We talked a lot about um, those regulations. There's a lot more regulation mechanisms that are involved, but these are kind of the big ones. Um, the G1 checkpoint, right, between G1 and S, the G2 checkpoint before mitosis itself, and then we've got a couple mechanisms, positive and negative, over here.